Welcome everyone to today's JQI seminar. I'm extremely thrilled to introduce John Simon. Um, so he did his PhD at MIT with Vladan Vuletic and then a postdoc with Marcus Greiner. And he does really amazing work with creative cavities, both in the optical and in the microwave. And he has given us Nathan, for which we're deeply grateful. And so now he's gonna give us an awesome talk, which I hope contains cat pictures. Um, there, I, I, so to, to leave room uh, for more science, there are no cat pictures in this one, unfortunately. Yeah, um, yeah, that's fair. I, this, this may be the only uh, cat picture in the talk right there. You can already tell I'm going to have a very hard time with this laser pointer. So I apologize for that. Uh, thank you, Alicia, for the invitation. I'm really uh, very happy to be here uh, seeing all of you guys today. Looking forward to lots of fun meetings. Um, what I will be telling you about, actually, let me start my timer. Uh, what I will be telling you about is ongoing work in my group um, and in collaboration with Dave Schuster, making uh, materials out of light. Um, so the way you can tell that I have terrible time management skills is that I'm going to put the acknowledgement slide uh, at the beginning, uh, because of course this is the most important slide. These are the folks uh, who have done uh, basically all of the work going into this science. Uh, and so uh, thank you to all of them, uh, and particularly uh, to my uh, friend and collaborator, Dave Schuster, most of this science is a collaboration with him. Um, so I think before we get into the, the details of the materials that we're making, the, uh, the place to start is to talk briefly um, about what it means uh, in my language to make a material so that as we succeed in doing it, um, we'll have some sense that we've that, that we've succeeded in, in what the rules of the game was, are. So to me, a material is a collection of particles that interact with one another and thereby sort of organize or order. Um, so the, the picture you should have in mind here, this is a simple classical model of a, a bunch of uh, interacting point particles. Uh, they attract each other at long distances, repel each other at short distances. We add a little bit of, uh, friction and they order into some classical crystal. Uh, and so the point is to make this happen, we needed these three ingredients. We needed the objects to act like particles. They need to respond to forces, okay? We need interactions between them, some distance dependent energy, uh, separation dependent energy, and then we need some way to suck entropy uh, out of this system. And with those three ingredients, we can get emergent sort of collective behaviors that lead to crystalline structures and so forth. Um, so the first challenge is that if you try to do this with photons, uh, photons actually don't behave like particles in the sense that we're used to. What do I mean by that? Well, if I have a, uh, a massive particle moving to the right and apply a force on it to the left, it decelerates and turns around and moves back to the left. If I perform the same experiment on a photon, it just changes color, okay? So it's doing something in response to a force, but it's not the thing that you want in any sense if you're gonna use your photon as a particle, right? It needs to accelerate and decelerate in response to forces. So the way to understand why this happens uh, in a language that's useful to us is that the dispersion relation of light, the relationship between its energy and its momentum is this line. And so as I apply a force, I change the momentum of the photon, but its velocity is the slope of the line at whatever momentum we're living at, and that slope is constant. And so as a consequence, applying a force to a photon doesn't change its velocity, okay? Um, so, the solution is to trap our light in some medium that changes its dispersion, and that will effectively give the photon a mass, okay? Because the slope of this line depends upon the momentum. Okay, so that's piece number one. Piece number two is that if I take two electrons and I bring them towards each other, they can bounce off of each other. But of course, Maxwell's equations are linear, so if I have a photon moving to the right and a photon moving to the left, well, when they pass, when they move towards each other, they can just pass through. This is to say that photons don't really collide with one another. Now, 
to solve this problem, the basic idea is that electrons collide by exchanging virtual photons, right? They, uh, and so you could ask, could we just invert this and have our photons collide by exchanging virtual electrons? Uh, well, the answer is that this Feynman diagram is disallowed by everything. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so no, but you can draw a higher order Feynman diagram that uh, does allow photons to collide. Here, the idea is that the photons exchange an electron-positron pair. Okay, so this is possible, but this cross section for visible photons is extremely small. But the idea here is, is kind of the right one, which is that we're going to have our photons collide by creating some material excitations. And here, here we're creating electron positron pairs, we're creating particles, right? But the idea that you could use excitations of a material to mediate interactions between photons is the basic idea that we're going to harness for our science here. Okay, so taking a step back then, the basic picture is that in a material, in the solid state, the uh, interactions between the electrons come from some Coulomb potential, okay? And we can change the dispersion relation of the electrons by trapping them in an ionic lattice that creates some band structure, okay? Um, and so what we're gonna do is use some material to mediate interactions between our photons, and we're gonna trap them either in a multimode cavity or in a lattice of cavities to make the photons, uh, to, to control their dispersion and make them act like massive particles that respond sensibly to forces. Okay, so, uh, this is sort of the broad overview of our science, and uh, uh, this is a, then the overview of the stories that I'd like to tell you today. Um, for, for the experts in the audience, this is uh, too much material for one talk. Um, <laughs> so realistically, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a piece of this story, making uh, materials out of optical photons, and as you'll see shortly, uh, this is really Nathan Shine's story, Professor Shine. Um, and so, but I'm I'm mostly going to tell this story to motivate the kinds of tools that one needs to develop and to give you a flavor of what it means to make a material out of light. I imagine many of you have heard this story, so we're just going to use this to kind of build up some language together. Um, and then, uh, if you've slept through that story, it's okay. Um, because you'll have a second opportunity, because our main focus today is going to be making materials out of strongly interacting microwave photons through dissipation engineering, and then through adiabatic preparation. We have some cool new schemes there. Uh, and then time permitting at the end, I'll talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, some recent work demonstrating high efficiency optical to millimeter wave uh, transduction. Um, so. Uh, again, what I would say is that the main theme of this talk is making materials out of light. The main theme of my group is that we love cavities. So this is where I will have my plug. Uh, if anyone else loves cavities or would like to love cavities, um, you should think about uh, joining us uh, for a postdoc uh, or for graduate school. Do we have any undergrads in the audience? Yeah, that's par for the course. Um, it's too early. What time is it? 11? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, so, so as a starting point, I want to just give you a flavor of how we make optical photons behave as charged interacting particles. The, uh, the basic takeaway here is that uh, making the photonic eigenstates behave as sort of the same eigenstates with the same eigen energies as uh, a, an electron in whatever system we're trying to realize uh, makes the uh, photons behave like the electrons, okay, is one way to think about this. Uh, and so th that is to say, if you make the photons behave like the electrons without the interactions and you make the interactions between the photons behave like the interactions between the electrons, you've basically made whatever physical model it is uh, that, that you're interested in studying. So um, this story is, uh, is uh, basically Professor Shine's story. He really pioneered this work uh, during his, uh, his PhD in my group. Uh, I was going to try to render him moving around in 3D in the cavity and rotating. 
Um, but I, but I did run out of time for that. And also, since he's a professor now, I think he has some dignity. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, so thanks. Um, so the central premise here is that a photon in a multi-mode optical cavity behaves like a massive particle in a harmonic trap. So we've of course all heard that light in a cavity behaves like a harmonic oscillator. And I just wanna point out that the way that you've probably heard that is not the sense in which I mean it, okay? The way that you've probably heard it is a cavity mode is a harmonic oscillator where which eigenstate you're in is how many photons are in that mode. Okay, that's not the analogy that we've got here. This analogy is actually an analogy for a single photon in real space, behaving like an electron in real space. So let's see if we can make some classical sense of how this works. The basic idea is I'm gonna send light into this cavity away from the center of the resonator axis up here. Uh, and the light is going to oscillate back and forth transversely like a massive harmonically trapped particle. So the way to understand this in a ray picture is to just watch the ray as it bounces back and forth between the two mirrors and see where it hits that central plane of the cavity, okay? And uh, what you can kind of see is that if the mirrors weren't curved, the ray would kind of move up forever. Um, and uh, the curvature of the mirror sort of traps the light and brings it back down. Okay, and so the picture you should have in mind is that the length of the cavity maps the tilt onto a displacement per round trip. And so that kind of sets the mass of the photon and the curvature of the mirrors provides the harmonic trapping. Okay, uh, and if you're interested in a more formal version of this story, uh, you can uh, take a look in that uh, manuscript. So great, uh, for those of you who would like to understand this in a wave picture, the basic story is that, well, the eigenstates of a quantum harmonic oscillator are Hermit Gauss in space and they're uniformly spaced in energy. And the eigenstates of an optical cavity are again, Hermit Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. Uh, and so this is to say that this analogy is, is really pretty accurate even quantitatively. And so now we can understand this transverse oscillation in space uh, as saying, well, we sent light into the cavity away from the resonator axis. And so I can write that as a superposition of the lowest mode of my cavity and the first excited mode. Uh, and the idea is that these two constructively interfere on the right and destructively interfere on the left. But because they have different frequencies, half a cycle later, this plus sign is turned into a minus sign and now they constructively interfere on the left and destructively interfere on the right. And this is just basically your standard picture of quantum harmonic oscillators and the coherent state oscillating back and forth. And it applies very nicely to our light. Okay, great. And so the picture that you should then have in mind, this is an artist's rendition uh, of this kind of a cavity uh, to the extent that I'm an artist, which is generous description, but. I'm wearing the microphone, so, you know. Um, uh, the idea is that the light is delocalized everywhere along the cavity axis and kind of oscillating back and forth like a massive harmonically trapped particle. Okay, and if you wanna add a magnetic field to this picture, the basic idea is gonna be to twist the cavity. Um, and to understand why that's the idea, we should look at, uh, at a periscope. And, and this is where I wanted to replace that tree uh, with a certain professor in your department, but uh, again, not enough hours in the day. So if I have this periscope for uh, elevating a beam and I look at the tree through the periscope, well, if the two mirrors are aligned to each other, the tree comes out right side up. If I rotate the upper mirror relative to the lower mirror, the tree comes out rotated by 90 degrees. Um, and as I rotate the upper one relative to the lower one, I can kind of change the angle uh, between but uh, uh, of rotation of the tree. And so the basic idea is going to be to take this kind of a beam elevator with a twist and then add two more mirrors to close the path back on itself. Okay. And so then on each round trip through the cavity, uh, the, uh, the image will rotate a little bit. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the idea. We take a four mirror cavity, we twist it a little bit and keep the mirrors pointed at each other. And the idea now is that you still have this 
photon mass coming from the round trip propagation, trapping coming from the curvature of the mirrors, but now also on each round trip, it's like the lab frame is a rotating frame, right? Because the path gets rotated a little bit on each round trip. And as we learned in, uh, in uh, undergraduate mechanics, if you're living in a rotating frame, um, you can kind of understand that as producing a Coriolis force and a centrifugal force on whatever the particle is. Um, and a Coriolis force looks like omega cross P. The centrifugal force, this force that pushes you outwards is omega squared times the, the radius from the rotation axis. And the interesting point is that omega cross P is basically like V cross B, okay? Um, because I can rewrite P as MV, right? And so this is saying that this kind of a twist of the cavity produces a magnetic field along the cavity axis. And to be clear, I'm not talking about twisting the cavity in time. I'm saying a fixed twist of the resonator produces a non-zero magnetic field in the lab frame for the photons, okay? Now, you might say, well, there's also this centrifugal force term, but this is just a harmonic anti-confining potential. So I can compensate for that with a harmonic trap, right? Just the curvature of the mirrors. Um, and so there's some uh, uh, several, I would say, pretty fun papers exploring these cavities in their own right, looking at the fact that the modes uh, of the cavity are these ring modes. And as you tune your cavity parameters, basically tuning the twist angle, you can reach a point where the harmonic trapping from the mirrors exactly cancels the centrifugal force term. And then you should be left with a Landau level which is where these Lagergas ring modes become degenerate. And if you ask, well, how degenerate are they? They're degenerate to within a few megahertz, okay? And uh, that means that if we could have interactions between our photons kind of on this energy scale, we could get uh, the photons to uh, sort of hybridize and collide with one another uh, and explore that Hilbert space of the generate eigenmodes in a way that minimizes their energy. And it turns out the minimum energy state that they can prepare in this lowest Landau level is a, is a Lachman state. Um, so uh, again, you know, this is just sort of a warm up. I don't want to talk too much about the Lachman state piece of it, but I do think it's worth talking about what collisions look like uh, in this kind of a model. Okay, and so we add collisions between our photons by having the photons talk to atoms. Um, using a technique, uh, I guess that, uh, is Trey here? Yeah, that Trey also uses this kind of Rydberg EIT uh, kind of an idea. So I wanted to give Excuse you just kind of- May I ask a question about uh, the slide before this, uh, the slide before the previous slide? Um, and uh, When you showed the relationship or the analogy between the Coriolis force and the magnetic force. Uh huh. Yes, thanks. Um, where is the Q in Q V cross B? Where does the amount of charge come from? So I guess what I would say is uh, it's, a, it's a little bit interesting because what we really control in practice in our experiments is Q times the magnetic field, okay? Uh, so I've written it as omega cross P is similar to V cross B, but probably the way you should write it, it's omega cross P is equal to omega cross MV, right? Which I can write as V cross M omega, right? And then M omega is like Q times B, right? So I don't have independent control of a magnetic field the parameter that I have control over in my experiment is kind of like the charge times the magnetic field. Or if you go through it even a little more carefully, what we really have control over is the magnetic length in the problem and the, and the cyclotron frequency, right? So, I mean, and it's an interesting thing to say because, I, and I, this is actually a great question because producing a magnetic field wouldn't be worth anything right, if we didn't produce a charge for the photons, right? If you apply a magnetic field to light, unless you believe in axions, um, which I suppose is a religion of a sort, but 
Um, but uh, unless you believe in axions, you're you're not going to see much coupling probably between a, a, an optical photon and a magnetic field. So really, what you want to do is produce a photon charge times a magnetic field, and that's what it really means to produce a synthetic magnetic field for light. Does that make sense? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, it's it's very weird to have the question up in the sky. You just say, does that? Make sense? <laughs> Has anyone seen Real Genius? You know the scene where uh, they, uh, it, it, they they take the, the really annoying guy, they put a, a speaker in his tooth um, and, and he thinks he's talking to Jesus. Maybe we're not allowed to joke about that anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe don't post this. It's lying. It's on YouTube. Oh, I, I, that's not nearly as bad as having it recorded. The, pr the, the proof is in the proof, uh, <laughs> such as it is. Okay, uh, so let's let's just talk briefly here about um, how we make the photons interact with each other. Um, so the idea is that I'm going to have light that's going to uh, transit through some atomic medium here. Okay. Um, and what we know is that when light goes through a medium, it can be absorbed by that medium. So I've got my atoms, they're gonna live in this ground state, it should be labeled 5P. And when a photon goes in, it can be absorbed by one of the many atoms here and get excited up to, excuse me, 5S, and it can be excited up to this 5P state. And then we have a strong laser that takes any atom in the 5P state and excites it up to some very high lying Rydberg state. And so the picture you should have is that as the light transits through the medium, it transits very slowly because uh, the, the Rydberg state is long lived. So the photon goes in, it gets excited to the P state, goes to the Rydberg state where it can live for a long time, then gets de-excited to the P state, gets re-emitted as a photon collectively by the atom. So it continues moving forward, gets reabsorbed. And so the weaker this blue beam is, the slower the light moves because the longer it can spend in that Rydberg state, okay? Great, so this is a way of making slow light, but the really interesting thing happens when I send in a second photon. And the basic idea is that if I go to a high enough Rydberg state, the size of the electronic orbitals uh, of these Rydberg electrons can be sort of similar to the size of this beam. And so what that means is the second photon would like to go slowly through the medium, but to do that, it has to be absorbed by one of these atoms and go up to the Rydberg state, but it can't because when the Rydberg atoms are as close together as sort of the beam size, the Rydberg state is moved away by more than the, uh, the line width of this transition. Uh, and so what that means in practice is that if the second photon is near the first photon, it moves fast. If it's far from the first photon, it moves slowly, right? Which means the first photon kind of creates a lens for the second photon, right? Uh, and, and you can then understand this formally, if you like, as sort of a photon-photon interaction. Okay. You said it's in the size of electronic orbitals. That's not what matters, right? For that interaction. Yeah, I mean, it's, yes, the story is more complicated than that. It also matters how stiff the orbitals are because you need to have a situation where the interactions between the electrons can lead to parent, I mean, we can tell them the whole story if you want to. So Alexei is one of the progenitors of this story. No, so he's upset that I. You like we're saying that yes. the size of what matters in the speed. Yeah, I, th I, it's, I would say it's sort of both things. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so in practice, what does this look like? We have some optical cavity with a relatively small mode. Um, we have an atomic sample down below. We transport it up into the cavity. The transport's a little faster than that in practice. Um, so this is uh, an actual picture of the atomic cloud and then a picture of the cavity mode superposed. Uh, and the idea is that this atomic sample in blue is a little bit too big so that the interactions between the atoms don't uh, extend over that whole range. And so we, uh, and by which I mean Nathan, uh, slices this cloud down to make it nice and thin. Um, and then you can look and you can see interactions between these photons spectroscopically. The basic idea is, uh, again, for experts, this the spectrum of the cavity has these two vacuum Rabi peaks, which correspond to exciting atoms up to the P state. 
Uh, and then this middle peak, which is narrower, which is this cavity EIT peak, uh, where it's narrow because the Rydberg state is long lived. Uh, and the idea is that this whole cavity, even though it's centimeters long, can only hold one photon at a time due to these photon-photon interactions. Uh, and so what you expect to see is when one photon goes in, if another one tries to enter, it reflects off uh, until the first one leaves. And we can see this very clearly uh, kind of in uh, it, looking at correlators of photons going through this system over many microseconds. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna skip over what one might call the sexy part of this, uh, depending on your, uh, your personal preferences where we talk about how to make Laughlin states in this story. But the basic idea is that we've talked through how to make all the ingredients and then putting them together and doing the many body physics is, uh, is kind of the next step. And one can see these collisions that change the orbitals of the photons and correlate them into Laughlin states. Um, great. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to chat with you about it uh, afterwards. But in the interest of time, I'll just say that we've built a, uh, a crazy new cavity where we're trying to remove some disorder in the Landau level by adding lenses to the system. Uh, this is uh, actually a real photo of the system where we have a blue buildup cavity to have more blue power. Uh, in the physics cavity, it's under vacuum. We're getting going there. Okay. Um, again, the, uh, the main meat of the story that I'd like to tell you in the uh, sort of remaining 20 to 25 minutes, um, I guess 20, is um, about uh, making materials out of microwave photons. Uh, and here, we're going to start with a little warm up about how to make the ingredients, how to make microwave photons act like they live in a lattice how to make them interact with each other. And then we're really gonna talk about the preparation schemes that one can use to make various different types of many body states uh, in this platform. So you wanna make a lattice site that can hold a photon. What's the simplest thing that you could imagine doing? How about an LC circuit, right? That can hold photons, right? The excitations of this thing are photons. This is that harmonic oscillator that I was telling you about earlier. Every photon you put in, well, it's gonna have a frequency of one over two pi root LC, right? Which we'll say is say 4.5 gigahertz. And I can put one photon in, which costs me 4.5 gigahertz of energy. I can put a second one in, a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, so forth. Here's the problem. What we'd really like is for these photons to interact with each other, right? Is it clear that this system does not have interactions between the photons? Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. The idea is that if the photons had interactions between them, the energy required to put in a second photon would be different than the energy required to put in the first photon. And the difference would be the interaction energy cost between the photons. If the second energy costs more, it's a repulsive interaction. If the second photon costs less, it's an attractive interaction. So for anyone who's ever built an LC circuit in the lab, well, what you know is if you drive it hard enough, the inductor will eventually heat up and deform. Uh, and when it does that, the frequency of the oscillator shifts a little bit, right? Is that an interaction between the photons? I would say yes, at some level. The only problem is that uh, you had to put in like 10 to the 15 photons, okay? Um, not intrinsically bad, but if you would like the photons to become entangled with each other, you'd like to see uh, that kind of a shift between say one photon and two photons. Because if you have to have 10 to the 15 to see the interaction, well, if you lose one of those 10 to the 15, all of your entanglement is gone. And so I would say at a fundamental level, the game for building highly entangled states is that the interactions should be large compared to uh, the, the lifetimes of the individual particles. Okay, so if you wanted to make the interaction larger, well, one thing you could do, you said, well, we were relying on the thing heating up to shift the frequency or the, some kind of mechanical deformation of my inductor. We should just make the inductor smaller. So it's more sensitive to those deformations. And it turns out you can keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller until you replace your inductor with what's called a Josephson junction. Now I'm an atomic physicist, 
Okay, I work very closely with Dave Schuster on this work. So for the atomic physicists in the audience, a Josephson junction is an inductor whose inductance depends on current. Do we have um, an Alexei counterpart who's gonna tell me that that's incorrect? Because it is incorrect. Um, but, but for our purposes, oh, did you think you weren't gonna get abused? <laughs> we, we go back a long way. Um, for, away, yeah. <laughs> um, so for our purposes though, I think this is good enough. Um, and so the picture you can have in mind is that when you replace your inductor with this Josephson junction, it can give you a zero to one transition. Your first photon costs 4.5 gigahertz of energy and your second one might cost 4.2 gigahertz of energy. And this is really wonderful because that says, well, for us, it's 300 megahertz of attraction between the photons. It's gonna turn out that for, uh, as long as you don't have much dissipation in your system, it doesn't matter whether it's attractive or repulsive. Um, but um, yeah, but but the point is this number is big. Okay, so we have strong interactions between individual photons. Now, let's say I want to have a photon that can hop from one lattice site to another lattice site. Because that was the other piece of the story, right? One piece was collisions between my photons. The other piece was I need dynamics. I need the particle to be able to move around in space. Well, it turns out here that getting hopping is as simple as putting an inductor between the lattice sites. And the amazing thing about circuit QED is that you can draw something like this and then all you have to do is send your graduate students to the lab uh, or to the fab facility and they can make it, right? It's, uh, it's uh, Alicia will agree, it's very easy. <laughs> um, no, I mean, in practice, there are lots of challenges associated with uh, controlling disorder in these systems and so forth. But, but fundamentally, you can draw out the circuit that you want and then, and then really uh, implement it lithographically and see, see it work. So, so this is the basic story. Uh, we're going to work with tunneling energies around 10 megahertz, interaction energies around 300 megahertz, which will mean that photons really never want to go from separate sites to the same site because they don't, you know, that would cost a 300 megahertz energy difference to do that. And there's no way to shed that energy. Okay, the last question is how long do the photons live in the system? Well, we see that our photons live for about 40 microseconds. Okay, and so that means that they can collide about 12,000 times within their lifetime or tunnel about 400 sites. And interestingly, even though the lifetime is much shorter well, the, than say for cold atoms in an optical lattice, the interactions are much faster. And so these products are quite similar, okay? And so at a fundamental level, you might expect to be able to make similarly complex many body states with photons in circuit QED as you can make with cold atoms and optical lattices. What we're gonna find is that the strengths of the systems are quite different. And so you can make sort of photons, uh, different models with photons effectively compared to with, uh, with uh, uh, cold atoms or with electrons, but fundamentally the figures of merit are pretty similar. Okay, so this is what the, uh, what the sample looks like. We've color coded it to make it a little clearer what's going on. Uh, each one of these objects is one of our lattice sites. We call them transmon qubits because you can treat them as two level systems. That's what these techniques were originally developed for quantum computing. Um, and we've sort of uh, hijacked them from anybody physics. So each one of these is one of our lattice sites. The capacitive coupling comes for, sort of from the proximity between them. And then we have a readout cavity for each lattice site so that we can detect its occupation uh, through a dispersive shift of that cavity. So you can think of this if you want as like a quantum gas microscope for uh, microwave photons. Um, so what if we want to make uh, some interesting many body states in this system? Well, I've told you how to get the ingredients. We have strongly interacting photons, right? Um, and they can hop from one lattice site to another like electrons in a solid. So you might say, well, you should just wait and eventually the system will cool down to its ground state. Well, that's true, but its ground state is no photons in the system, which is maybe not so interesting, right? So you can't actually just wait. And this is sort of similar to cold atoms, right? You have to come up with some kind of a protocol to make the state 
that you're interested in, okay? With cold atoms, the typical protocol is, well, we take some atoms that we capture with a magneto-optical trap, okay? And then we uh, evaporatively cool them to Bose-Einstein condensation, and that makes a very low entropy initial state. And then we adiabatically turn on a lattice, and that takes us from the many-body ground state without the lattice, which is just Bose-Einstein condensate, into the many-body ground state with the lattice, which can have strong correlations. But the fundamental point is, you know, that those are the strengths of cold atom platforms. Adiabatically changing our tunnelings, this kind of stuff, that's not really the strength of circuits. You know, we lithographically pattern our circuit. And in principle, we could pattern elements that let us change the tunneling, but that just makes it much more complicated. So the first question we ask is, is there a class of models that are easy for, for, for us to explore that are sort of different from cold atoms? So let me show you how one might make a sort of chemical potential for light, okay, to suck entropy out of the system. The basic idea is, imagine I could have one lattice site on the left, Okay, which I'll call my stabilizer or narrow band chemical potential. And the, the idea of this lattice site is going to be that if it's ever empty, it fills itself up with one photon. And if it ever has two photons, it emits one of them into free space and you lose it. And it goes back to having one photon. And I'm going to tune this resonator or this, whatever this object is, to be resonant with the last site in my we call it Bose Hubbard chain and my chain of lattice sites. And the idea is, well, that photon can hop into my system and then this thing will refill itself. But now this photon can't hop into my chain, right? Because it would have to have a different energy. So we're stuck until this one hops over and then another one can hop in and so on and so forth. And, and so you can kind of think of this actually as how a chemical potential works. And this would stabilize uh, what one might call a crystal of light or a mod insulator, bosonic mod insulator of photons. Um, and there's a whole theory of how these, uh, how these objects might work. This, this field was really pioneered by uh, Muhammad and uh, Elliot Cap Caput in the, like 2014, 2015 uh, on the theory side. Uh, and so, the question is, how do we implement this object on the left? I've shown you how to make the thing on the right. How do we make the thing on the left? And this is really where circuit QED shines, okay? Um, we would like to make an object that always has one photon. If it ever has zero, it ends up with one. If it ever has two, it ends up with one. Well, you might say, well, why not just drive it resonantly on the zero to one transition? That's easy enough, right? Well, that takes it from zero to one, but if it's in the one state, it takes it from one to zero, which is not what you wanted, right? So that's not gonna work, but anyone who's done optical pumping knows that the real trick is to drive it from zero to two, okay? And then have the two state decay really fast, okay? And if the two state decays fast enough, well, then it'll live in the one state for a while, and if it ever decays to zero, it's rapidly re-excited back to two, Right, and then it decays back down to one, uh, and uh, and live and it lives in one for a long time. Okay, and so the challenge is, how do we make it decay fast from two to one? And this is the cool thing: I can just add an RLC circuit, which is resonant with that two to one transition and has some damping, to to damp that transition and make that decay fast. And this is something I can really do beautifully for circuits that's uh, that's harder with atoms. Okay, and, and indeed we, we do this in the experiment. So I'm gonna show you an eight site chain uh, with the stabilizing object, this uh, narrow band chemical potential at the right end. And when I look versus time, the system goes from totally empty to full over a couple of microseconds. Okay, and you can see kind of a Lieb Robinson bound limited filling front bouncing back and forth off of the uh, the, the edges of the system. Uh, and um, we can then ask, well, what happens if I get rid of a particle? Because in steady state, this thing should be able to refill defects, right? Um, and if I do that without the stabilizing drive on, without a connection to this object, and I look versus time, well, what I see, and again, this is data, is this random walk back and forth through the system, quantum random walk. And if I do it with the stabilizing drive on, the, uh, the whole walks across the system and gets eaten and then it's gone. So this sort of uh, 
uh, protocol works very beautifully as long as you're in a limit where I can put particles into the system of a fixed energy until I hit some energy gap, right? And if I add another particle, it would require a very different amount of energy to add that particle to the system, okay? So this is states that look somewhat classical like mod insulators and states like fractional quantum Hall states, which are somewhat more exotic, but require building sort of more interesting lattice structures. And we're pushing in that direction as well. But one question we asked was, is there a way that we can make sort of strongly correlated, highly entangled fluids of light um, where the state is potentially compressible? So this is a situation where I have, I'm at half filling. Instead of having a photon in every site, maybe I'm gonna have a photon on average in every other site. Okay, can I make that with this same kind of a trick? Well, the answer is no, because you can see that this state is somewhat compressible. There's a small energy difference between two photons in the system and three, right? It doesn't cost exactly the same amount of energy to add the second photon as the third, but it's pretty similar. And so this kind of chemical potential stabilization technique, which is very sensitive to how different those energies are, isn't gonna work very well. So the question is, is there some set of tools that we've got at our disposal that we can use to make these strongly correlated fluid states? Um, and, and the answer turns out to be yes, that what tools do we have at our disposal? Well, we can pi pulse photons into individual sites, right? That is to say, we drive a microwave tone at the resonant frequency for that site. That'll take it from zero photons to one, but it can't take it to two because the transition from one to two is at a different energy, right? So if we leave that tone on for just the right amount of time, we go from zero to one. And if we left it on for longer, we'd go back to zero. Okay, so that's with these pi pulses. And we can also tune the energies of the lattice sites. And it's gonna turn out that those two ingredients are enough to start to build these uh, more exotic uh, few body states. So, so what does this look like? Let's start with the simplest story. Let's say I wanna make single particle eigenstates in this model. Well, let's imagine I put a bunch of disorder into the lattice, okay? What is that gonna do? It's gonna localize all of the single particle eigenstates. If my disorder is much more than my tunneling energy, well, the highest energy eigenstate is just gonna be a photon in this site. The second highest energy eigenstate is just a photon in that site. These eigenstates are very easy to prepare with pi pulses, right? If I wanted to prepare the eigenstate without disorder, well, that's some pretty delocalized photon over here. That's maybe more complicated to prepare. So, but what we can do is we can put in this disorder, we can pi pulse a photon into that site, and then we can adiabatically remove the disorder, okay? Um, and if we put the photon instead of into the highest energy site, into the second highest energy site, well, then we would expect to prepare the second highest energy eigenstate. And again, you might be confused, why the heck is John talking about the highest energy eigenstates? Well, basically it's because our interaction energies are negative and our tunneling energies are negative. So if you just pretend in your head that I'm saying lowest energy and second lowest energy, you're gonna do fine. You're doing great except for you, Alexei. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at what this looks like experimentally. Uh, we start in this disordered configuration. We put a photon into this highest energy site up here, and then we look versus time. Again, this is data at uh, the occupations of the sites as we remove the disorder. And we produce this uh, you know, highest energy single particle eigenstate. And we can perform the same experiment for the second highest energy single particle eigenstate. Uh, it does exactly what it should do. Uh, the interesting thing though, uh, well, okay, before we get ahead of ourselves and talk about two particles, the next question you should really ask is how do we know that that state that we made is the state that we wanted to make? Well, one thing you could say is, well, John, I can just diagonalize the Hamiltonian and see what the state I should make is and see if I made it. And you're not wrong about that, but once I'm doing some complicated many body state, it may be very hard to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, okay? And so we would like to have some confidence that we made the state that we were intending to make um, 
without having to, uh, to, to, to know what, what that, that state was. So the idea is to tune to degeneracy, like remove the disorder, and then put the disorder back in. Okay, and the idea is, if you do that too quickly, you won't be adiabatic, and you won't prepare at this middle point the many body ground state. You'll prepare some other state, some superposition of states, because you'll have some diabatic crossings. Okay, and then when you ramp back, you'll have even more diabatic crossings, and so you won't end up in the same lattice site that you started in. Okay, but if you go, oops, if you go slowly enough, the particle will delocalize and then it will relocalize, right? And so just making a measurement of this single lattice site's occupation after that ramp, removing the disorder and putting it back in should tell us whether we made the right state in the middle, okay? So what I plot is here is the probability that I went back to that same lattice site as a function of the ramp time. Okay, and what you see is for the slowest ramps, I do indeed go back to where I started and you can start to see a little decay here from the finite lifetime of the photons, okay? And then if I go a little faster, well, everything goes to heck, right? Which is because I'm not being adiabatic. And it's interesting, you can kind of see, remember I told you the tunneling energy was like 10 megahertz. So one over 10 megahertz is about hundred nanoseconds. And so you can see it takes up to factors of two pi of or a couple of tunneling times for the photons to delocalize and relocalize. Okay, but then there's an interesting thing at very short times, which is it also looks like it was adiabatic if I went really, really fast. And, and this is to say there's a caveat in interpreting this data, right? Which is basically if you go really fast, well, the photon didn't have time to delocalize. You went through a ton of diabatic crossings when you tune to degeneracy because the photon just stayed in the same lattice site. And then you ramp back and it still stayed in the same lattice site. So you better be careful to take this whole curve to make sure that you've really prepared the state you meant to prepare. Yes? Could you just add like some wait time in your super fluid regime? That, well, that's an interesting thought. I don't care what people say about you. Actually, honestly, I don't know who you are. That's a good idea. <laughs> that's a very nice idea. Um, yeah, that's cool. We should try that. That, that would make this uh, much less confusing data. Of course, that might add some more wiggles in between. So uh, although what you find is that these wiggles, people often ask about them, what does that mean? It's sort of what you're saying. It's some evolution of the superposition state that happens to constructively interfere a little bit more uh, going back to the initial state. But the larger your system size is, the kind of better behaved um, it gets in the middle. And then I think your, your story would just work perfectly. Ramp, wait a fixed amount of time, and then ramp back. Yeah, we should try that. Thank you. Um, OK, um, so that's an underlying thing to think about. And what that really gave us was ability, an ability using local measurements to get a real sense of whether we're making some complicated state that we want in the middle, okay? So th but you can also do this with two particles, right? Remember the, the, the lowest energy two particle state is gonna be in the disordered system is just putting the two particles in the two lowest energy lattice sites, right? And for three particles, in the disordered system, it's just putting photons into the three lowest energy lattice sites. So we have this situation where we can make whichever state we want, they're sort of indexed and accessible in a very localized way when we have disorder. And then if you adiabatically remove the disorder, well, you go from two particles in these two sites to this delocalized state. This is comparing it to a tonks girardot theory. It agrees very nicely. So this is plotting the average densities. Um, and you can ask, well, what if instead of plotting the average densities, we plot the correlators between the photons? And what you see is that uh, when you renormalize by the sort of average density of the system, the photons avoid each other on average by about one, you know, the length scale of that average, one over that average density. Um, and this, 
is really this uh, tonks Girardeau theory that, uh, so, so, so the experiment, it's actually funny. This is a continuum theory that we're comparing it to. And up to filling factors of a half, where you might expect a lot of deviation from the continuum theory, it works pretty well. Um, we've also made some measurements in the continuum or in the lattice system of the, uh, the entanglement at degeneracy to make sure, yeah, the photons are avoiding each other, but are they also so uh, delocalized in some meaningful sense. And this is sort of making measurements of single particle density matrices, single site density matrices, really. Uh, and the, but it, this is sort of a topic for experts. It's just to say that the entanglement goes up when you go to degeneracy, which means the photons are delocalizing. And when you ramp back, the entanglement uh, between the sites goes back down because the eigenstates have really localized. Okay. But, but this suggests a sort of interesting thing that's now possible, okay? I've told you how to prepare an arbitrary eigenstate. And how do we do it? Well, we pi pulse a particle in, we pi pulse another particle in, uh, we can pi pulse a third particle in. And then the idea is that we just ramp to degeneracy in each of those configurations and we prepare some many body state entangled state of these photons when we remove the disorder. But what if I replaced that last pi pulse with a pi over two pulse? Well, now we can make these measurements and we can see that if we just sit in the disordered limit, well, we've prepared a superposition of the two particle state and the three particle state. So half the time we have a photon here, half the time we don't, that's not that interesting. If you look at the average densities in the system, when we ramp to the de degeneracy, the, or the ordered lattice, we've sort of prepared an, at, at a superposition of the two particle many body state and the three particle many body state. Um, and it just gives us an average of their two densities. But the interesting question to ask is, is there any coherence between these two kind of few body states that we prepared? So I'd like to uh, propose an experiment. What I've been showing you is prepare this superposition, ramp to degeneracy, and then just measure, right? Just look at the densities. But what if what I do is I drive the pi over two pulse to prepare the superposition of these two few body eigenstates, ramp to degeneracy, wait, and then ramp back, and then apply another pi over two pulse. And so this is an interesting thing because the point is the way I was determining which many body state I was preparing was with that one lattice site. So all of the information was localized into that one, if you want to call it qubit, right? And so the phase of that qubit depends uh, between its zero state and its one state after that whole ramp depends upon the phase difference acquired between those too many body states during that hold time. So what we expect to see then when we perform this kind of an experiment, this is wild. I think your thing must have more colors, your projector than my computer screen, <laughs> or the colors are varying across the screen. I don't know what's going on because those are really supposed to be the same color. So you learn something new every day. Today, I learned two things. Uh, so that's good. Uh, but so let's look at what, what happens experimentally with this kind of a few body Ramsey sequence. We can see a Ramsey fringe on this qubit reflecting the fact that we've made a superposition of these two few body states. And so we can do this for a superposition of putting zero photons and one photon into the system. And here I'm showing you as a function of the ramp time, and the hold time. So for the fastest ramp times, for very short ramps, this has many frequencies in it. So this, and then if I take the Fourier transform of this curve, I'm preparing all, basically all of the single particle states, okay? As I ramp slower and slower, eventually I'm just preparing one frequency here. As you can see here, we're preparing one frequency. To be clear, this is, changing the ramp time over like three full decades. So uh, when you get to the slowest ramps, you prepare just one 
a superposition of two eigenstates. And you can do the same experiment for a superposition of one and two particles and two and three particles, okay? And so you should now think of this as like a new type of Ramsey interferometry, right? For detecting, uh, you know, energy differences between many body states. You can think of it as a way of measuring compressibility if you want. I would say we're sort of starting to combine a little baby quantum computer with a little baby quantum material and seeing what happens when you look at the two things at the same time. Um, the data that I'm going to show you to, uh, to finish up here is preliminary. The way that you can tell that it's preliminary is that I picked the two ugliest colors I could think of and put them together. Um, my father is colorblind, so as far as he's concerned, this slide is just yellow or brown or something. But, you know, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, these shoes uh, were were the were the only Allbirds color that was both on sale and in stock. So, <laughs> and, and in my size, we, we, I have a lot of requirements. Okay, okay. Um, so we can do a superposition of system sizes as well. This is pretty cool, I think. If you want to look at a superposition of n particles in five sites and n particles in six sites, how can you use these techniques to do that? Well. Here's the idea. Imagine I take the last lattice site in my chain and I detune it by the interaction energy U, okay? Now, if I don't have a photon in that site, the other particles can't tunnel into the site, right? Because we're detuned by U. Jay really doesn't like this idea. You know what? I respect your opinion. I have, I have, I have tenure now. That's fine. See you later. Yeah. Um, if I do have a photon in this site, this other photon can hop, hop in and out. And so it's like my system has one more lattice site. So the smart Alex in the audience, also known as the experts, are probably about to complain that the tunneling rate here is a factor of root two higher right, once there's a particle in that lattice site. That's correct, but what we can do is uh, modulate the energy of this lattice site to put sidebands on it that move some of the spectral weight away to reduce the spectral rate, the spectral weight at this energy by a factor of root two. Uh, and, uh, and that actually works beautifully. So I can give you a little bit of preliminary data here. This is versus modulation strength. So obviously you can see that the correct modulation strength is right there. No? Okay, well, I can't tell either. But, but, but this is sort of, to, sort of to give you a flavor of, uh, of what's possible with this kind of a platform and with these ideas of combining like a little baby uh, quantum computer with, uh, with a synthetic quantum material. So I think uh, this is a good place to end. I'll just point out that we have a whole other set of experiments combining the superconducting circuits with, uh, with cold atoms. And what we've achieved so far is transduction uh, of uh, optical to millimeter wave photon and back with you know, kind of 50 to 60% efficiency uh, for that transduction step. So with that, thank you all for your attention. Great to be here. Is open for questions. Yeah. This is body voice but also open for questions. We, What's the meaning of turtle? Oh, I mean, somebody had to ask the question uh, or answer the question. I, a turtle seemed good. Normally, I would use a cat, but I got some feedback that there were too many cats in my talk. So we've scaled back on the cats. So preparing these, uh, say, a, like fancy two, three particle states, I mean, could you also prepare them somehow? I mean, they're separated by tiny gaps there, right? So mm -hmm. could you like prepare them slowly by somehow preparing the one station state, you know, by relying on a small gap from one to two, like a Swiss Monroe that is extremely small now? So, so here's what I would say. I think there we've done some states that way. And the the challenge, I would say, is that there, 
you're reliant on having a good matrix element between the states, which says something about how localized the particles are, like how physically similar the states are, right? And good enough lifetimes. So here you're a little bit less sensitive to that, right? There's no, there's no matrix element question. We can look at states that are very, very different as long as we can prepare them at the initial end. And so what we've started to do is really treat the initial thing as a quantum computer so that you can see occupation dependent shifts of adjacent sites in the disordered limit. And so then I can put a photon into this site conditioned on whether there is or isn't one on the neighboring site. And then you have a lot of flexibility about what states you can make. I would say none of this beats the fundamental limits imposed by the kind of adiabaticity, the energy gaps when you go through a phase transition. You don't beat that, but you do win over the matrix element limits. Is there a sneaky loophole that like, if the two states have a bad matrix element between them, then it's hard to be adiabatic to both? Or mm, what an interesting question. You're you showing from a localized thing. It's maybe it just hates going anywhere because they're all they're equally bad. But like, that's a good question that I don't have a good answer to. But I, I think that's actually a fascinating question. Uh, I'm always looking for no free lunch theorems. Uh, so if there were a no free lunch theorem like that, it would be pretty satisfying and pretty disappointing. So I've now hedged my bets, which is. Uh, of the, the two states? Yeah. Mm -mm. I don't think the overlap of the two states matters. Sorry, the but it's not just those two states, it's the overlap to all states. That's what you meant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the energy gap is a good idea to just kind of include it, but you would be overlap if, if we have zero overlap with the next and well, uh, I think I think maybe we're com we're comparing apples to oranges a little bit here. I think what Alicia was saying was, Alexei made this comment that you could try to prepare those superposition states in the ordered system with pi pulses, and there you care about the overlap between those two eigenstates. And I was claiming that I don't care so much about the overlap between those two eigenstates with with this other approach. Now, you say we care about the overlap with all eigenstates. So maybe, I see, and you're just saying maybe that's worse. It could well be. Yeah, maybe we don't even need a no free lunch theorem. It's all terrible. But I think it's true that if the two states that you want to go to have a very small matrix element, then at some point in the ramp, they are very close together. Because they don't avoid each other well. Well, they have different particle numbers too, potentially. So they may avoid each other nicely. Let me point out another kind of pleasant thing about this is that you don't have to be perfectly adiabatic because as you get close, the eigenstate that you're interested in becomes the brightest one. And the fact that there are some other pairs that are still there a little bit isn't such a big deal. I have another question, if Hi. there's time. Uh, yes, by the way, the disembodied voice is from Nicole Younger Halpern. Uh, ah, first, hello, Nicole. Hello. So first, I have a comment, and that uh, is, I think, the correct answer to the question, why is there a turtle on the final slide, is um, you are being very considerate in tailoring your talk to your audience because the a, a turtle is the mascot of the University of Maryland. Oh, is that the correct answer? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind, it's a little suggesting. bit embarrassing because I grew up in Maryland, but yeah, no, it's. I apologize. Yeah, that's... That's why there's a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and my question is, um, what is the holy grail metamaterial that is a, a very far reach, but that you would really, really love to realize with light? So mm, the thing that I'm most excited about right now, I don't know if this is the absolute holy grail. We have made, uh, quarter flux churn lattices for microwave photons uh, that have churn bands and edge states and all that good stuff. Um, and what we need to do is add a bunch of uh, qubits to that lattice so that we can uh, 
like make fractional quantum Hall states and explore uh, any unbraiding there. And one thing I would say in particular, you know, for a long time, I thought the any unbraiding was, you know, more or less out of reach. It wasn't clear how to do it. Um, I do feel like as we've started to understand these impurity interferometry ideas, and I should say what I showed you here is, is sort of riffing on these ideas from, uh, from Misha and Fabian Grutzt and others to use an impurity and Ramsey interferometry on that impurity to understand properties of a, of a many body system, particularly uh, you know, many body winding numbers. Uh, and, I, and I think this is potentially a good way to get at those ideas. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. One more piano. How adiabatic can you be? Is this so obviously you're, you're limited by the coherence happening in kind of thinking about like, you know, the P1 or the P2? I mean, you have to go wrong with whatever intent might have been the first process. That's a good question. So the T1s are like uh, 40, but these are flux tunable qubits. Uh, so you, as you've correctly noted, the T2s are quite a bit shorter, a few microseconds typically. Um, what I would say is it's not totally clear to me because the tunneling between adjacent lattice sites is actually quite a bit larger than one over T2. Right, so there's some kind of a, a stabilization of the dephasing effects, and it's also not so clear how much of the T2 is coming from external B fields in his common mode. So, I mean, it's it's actually an interesting thing. Like maybe what I guess the way to answer that would be to do some numerics, um, and and see what our coherence times agree with. Uh, and, and honestly, probably this data that I showed you is enough. Um, and what I really need to do is uh, ask the student, uh, oh, this doesn't have any, any decay in it. So maybe that's really the point. If we add a little bit of T1. No, no. So this is, this is data, the dots, and this is numerics. The solid curve is numerics. Yes, yeah, so this is this this is the decay in the data, but the numerics don't have any decay. And so the question is, does that decay to correspond to the 40 microseconds or to something shorter? And I don't know the answer to that. It looks like it's probably something shorter, but yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you. It's a great question. That I think we should wrap up. So it's thank you again.